Unbelievable. We're asking, what is the best explanation of the universe, God or naturalism? I'm really excited about today's show because two eminent physicists are joining me on the programme. We love doing these kinds of debates on Unbelievable. Luke Barnes joins me in studio. He's an astrophysicist researching at the Sydney Institute for Astronomy. He's a Christian, believes that there are significant elements of our growing knowledge of cosmology that are consistent with a theistic worldview. Uh, his recent book, A Fortunate Universe, Life in a Finely Tuned Cosmos, was co-authored with atheist physicist Geraint Lewis. And both authors agree on the so-called fine tuning of the universe, but differ on whether it offers evidence for a creator. If you want to find out more about Luke, lukebarnes.info and the book there. Sean Carroll is our other guest, uh, joining us on the line from the States. He's a, a well-known cosmologist and research professor of physics at Caltech in the USA. Uh, Sean is an atheist. His most recent book, The Big Picture, on the origins of life, meaning and the universe itself, sets out why he believes naturalism best explains the nature of the universe we inhabit, as extraordinary and mysterious as it is. And, well, rather um, suitably, he's got a similarly titled website to a fortunate universe. His is preposterousuniverse.com, if you want to find out more about Sean and his regular blogs there. And so today we're going to be examining why both these brilliant cosmologists come to such different conclusions about whether there could be a divine origin for the universe. Um, we'll be talking about poetic naturalism. We'll be looking at whether there is a, a, a divine cause for the universe, whether fine tuning of the universe uh, proposes evidence for design and so on. All important issues, ones we've done before in various ways and unbelievable, but always so interesting to get new guests and new takes on these issues. So. Uh, Sean and Luke, welcome along to the programme. Thanks for having me. Thanks. It's great to have you both. Um, so um, let's start with you, Luke, as uh, you've flown all the way from Australia to be on the programme today. Uh, not really. You've, 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 you've got other things to do, I think, with your time while you're here. But um, you're, you're over here on just a little sort of um, speaking tour with your co-author, I believe, Geraint. Yes, we'll be around the place. We'll be speaking in uh, various places around the country and uh, telling people sort of both sides of what this whole fine tuning thing's about. And tell us about your own background. You, you're a Christian, um, but you're a physicist. You're someone who sort of spends your time looking into the, the workings of the universe. Um, to what extent would you say the two kind of cooperate with each other on, in terms of, the, you know, your study in the area and, and what it, whether it does or doesn't sort of tie in with your belief in God? Well, most of the everyday work of the, the physicist, I think it looks the same, whatever your views are. So I write papers with Geraint and he's an atheist. And, mm -hmm. It's basically tr we're trying to work out how the universe works. And, and, and for Geraint, it's working out what the ultimate principles of the universe are. And for me, it's working out how God made the universe. And, <laughs> and, uh, but, but we're asking the same sorts of questions. Absolutely. Um, and with this latest book, uh, A Fortunate Universe, Life in a Finely Tuned Cosmos, it's interesting that, that you've co-authored this. Uh, so I guess that was intentionally with the idea of an atheist and a Christian both looking at the same evidence, obviously agreeing in large degree on the, the phenomenon of fine tuning. And we'll come to define that a bit later, but with different parting ways when it comes to whether God or um, something else is a valid explanation. Yeah, I'd, I'd say there are a range of views, but Geraint and I, for the, for the most part, agree on the, the basic story about what would happen if if certain properties of our universe were different, if if this particle were heavier or that sort of thing. So, yeah, so we, the, the, most of the book is just us trying to explain what would happen. Mm. And then the, the last chapter is just what, what do we think all this means? Great. And do, do you find that there's a sort of significant conversation going on in the sciences around the kind of metaphysical implications, I suppose, of, of cosmology and fine tuning and, and that kind of thing? Um, because obviously I live in, and breathe the world of sort of Christian apologetics and theology. So maybe I, I, I have a you know, see it more than it actually is. I don't know whether generally physicists are, are talking about the way these things connect with questions about ultimate causes and so on. If they do, it's usually in the pub, I find. <laughs> so there, there is a, a, a sort of scientific question of fine tuning about why are these why these numbers have the value that they mm. do. And there's, you know, I was at a conference a couple of months ago, which brought together scientists and philosophers to talk about that sort of thing. And so that conversation's happening and, and you know, in the pub afterwards... <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of talk about what it means. Okay, um, so I'd, I'd love to be part of the conversation. I'm sure it would all mostly go over my head, but um, in any case, it's it's great to have you in the UK for a little while and able to come into the unbelievable studio and 
and talk about this stuff, Luke. Thank you for coming in. Thank you. Um, Sean Carroll is also on the line from the US, well-known cosmologist, research professor of physics at Caltech in the USA. Um, Sean, y have you sort of basically been involved in science since as long as you can remember, would you say? Science, yeah, I probably got interested in back when I was around 10 years old, reading books in the library, uh, hearing about the Big Bang and black holes and quarks and leptons. And I thought, you know, I want to do that for a living, whatever it is. And uh, so far, so good. I've not uh, grown past the ambitions of my 10 year old self. <laughs> Great ambition to have from from 10 years old. Um, what about your your atheism, though? Um, I think are you happy to wear that label firstly? And and um, is that something that has always been there or, or something that you adopted at a, a later stage in life? Uh, I mean, I'm happy to wear it if someone says that I'm an atheist, I don't disagree with them because it's true. It's not the first self-description that I choose just because the obvious reason that it's just saying something I don't believe is true rather than something I do believe is true. Mm. But uh, I wasn't born an atheist. I guess, that, no, that, technically I was born an atheist. <laughs> when I literally was born, I didn't have many beliefs about the bigger picture questions. But I grew up in a fairly mildly religious uh, you know, suburban white American family, going to an Episcopalian church, etc. And it was gradually through my junior high school, high school, college years that I became uh, uh, more clear about what I believed and that, that that was an atheist point of view. And you've never seen any reason to adopt any other kind of worldview than that? No, not at all. Okay. Um, obviously, you've very much been involved in some of the, you know, fairly high profile discussions on, on at, at this level. Um I mean, again, I'd, I suppose I'd ask the same question as I did of, of Luke. Do you think this is a going concern uh, generally, you know, in the physics and, and in the community as to whether there are theistic or implications to the kinds of things that science is telling us about the universe? Um, yeah, I think that that's an interesting question. And there's sort of two different levels to it. One is when physicists or scientists more generally come together to understand how the world works at the most fundamental level. How much of a role does God or something beyond the physical world actually play? And there, the answer is you know, almost zero. There's the occasional uh, person. Don Page is a good friend of mine who is one example who likes to throw God into his uh, occasional cosmology seminars. But at the 99.9% .9 level, whether you're doing molecular biology or chemistry or astrophysics, God has nothing to do with anything. I actually think that's very telling. I mean, I think 500 years ago it would have been a very different story. But modern science not only doesn't need to rely on uh, explanations that are based on God, but t doesn't even contemplate that that would be a thing to do. The other level is, of course, the more the public sphere or the broader conversation, where, of course, a lot of people are religious. Uh, a lot of people have some either clearly or vaguely defined sense of something beyond the physical world. And there, I think it's kind of a shame that there's not more conversation between scientists and other people, uh, whatever their beliefs might be. You know, I, I have my point of view, Luke has his point of view, but the important thing is that we're both out there acknowledging that these things have something to do with each other. Mm. And I, I, I get very sad or puzzled by people who want to pretend that these things are completely independent, like that we can talk about how the world is and then talk about the existence of God as if those two things are somehow not connected. Well, great introduction to sort of the way you approach these things. And uh, we're going to be getting into the, 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 big, the big picture that you set out in your most recent <clears throat> book called The Big Picture. Um, we're going to be talking about poetic naturalism. Uh, we're going to be talking about fine tuning. We're going to be talking about Big Bang cosmology in the course of today's program. We ask, what is the best explanation for the universe, God or naturalism? I'm sure there's going to be lots of people responding to today's show. If you'd like to be one of them, then why not email me your thoughts about today's program? That's unbelievable at premier.org.uk. You can also find us online, of course, at premierchristianradio.com slash unbelievable. Uh, leave comments underneath today's show. Share it on. Find the podcast. And indeed, this was comments yesterday, right? yesterday, account right? and, uh, Twitter accounts as well. All the social media links <laughs> available from the web page. Again, premierchristianradio.com slash unbelievable. Part of the press. Part of the press. That Sean is talking about ontology and the things that we can do with science and and commercial it's free. That, you, know, you just look at the world and that's... Okay. Go ahead, Cam. 
So with uh, Sean's introduction, did you hear anything in there that you thought was worth disputing? Disputing? Uh... Well, when he was describing himself born and raised basically an atheist, I think he alluded to that he didn't even... Um, well, no, when he was talking about when you're in the science lab, lab, uh, laboratory, whether you're a physicist or a chemist, God's not really mentioned. It's not needed. The concept of God is not necessary to do science, um, to actually do it. And so I thought that was an interesting statement. And the fact that he uh, seemed like he, as a scientist, has no need for it. But this is still an interesting question of we have this universe. What best explains it? What What did you hear that you thought a, a Christian or uh, theist might not, dispute? Not too much. But, I mean, the the idea that you can be born an atheist, I think, is like a, a controversial one. <laughs> Oh, yeah. You know, and you, you get that common retort of, okay, well, are rocks atheists? Um, but that's an important question because uh, the default position of many theists is, well, I believe in God, prove that there isn't one. Whereas the atheist default position is, well, I don't think there's a God. I don't believe there's a God. Demonstrate or prove to me that there is one. So the default position, the null hypothesis uh, for the two different worldviews are very different. So another thing is that uh, there's this kind of common theistic position that um, science can only really be done based on assumptions that require God. So, you know, one assumption people think that science has is the uniformity of nature and, you know, that um, we can make inferences about the future based on the past and, and things like this. And I've heard a, like quite a number of Christians claim that that's something that you really shouldn't be doing if you're a naturalist. And so when Sean says, um, you know, that for most working scientists, God isn't playing a role in their, um, you know, doing of science, I don't know, maybe maybe Christians would object to that. Well, I would think just the opposite as far as like if you do bring in uh, the concept of a deity of a all-powerful creator God, um, then you can question the uniformity of nature. Then it's possible that miracles, this is the suspension of uh, the uniformity could happen. So it seems like God complicates science rather than helps it because now anything could happen technically. But anyhow, let's... Should we, yeah, we should continue. We have to think philosophically about these yeah. things. I guess, Sean, in that level, you, you may be part company slightly with some of your peers who might say, you know, um, my position is simply the, the natural position, if you like. Uh, I don't need to defend atheism or naturalism or whatever because it's sort of uh, the de facto position. Whereas I, you're, you're more keen on actually saying, no, we, we have something to present here, a, a kind of a worldview to actually defend at some level. I think that there's two separate issues here that I don't want to get completely um, mixed up together. One is the idea that we can say that there exists the physical world obeying the laws of physics and that we are then done saying things. Uh, that's sort of an ontological claim and that is one that I disagree with. I think that there, as Luke says, there's more to talk about in terms of purpose and meaning and values and so forth. And we can have sensible, intelligent, cogent conversations about those things as naturalists, but they're not obvious conversations. We have to think about them and really work things out. So that is one way that some naturalists disagree with other naturalists. Mm. There's a very different issue about what needs defending. I, I think that I don't even know that many naturalists who think that their viewpoint doesn't need defending. And I think that one of the sort of frustrating ways that many people who disagreed with my book commented on it was that they took things that I thought I had presented a point of view and then argued for it and presented evidence for it. And they seemed to think that they were assumptions that I was making rather than things that I was concluding. I, I certainly don't think that naturalism is 
uh, a priori or just, you know, something that doesn't need defending. It's one of the hypotheses on the table, like many, many others are. I think we come to naturalism by reasoning and, and collecting evidence. We do not start with it as an assumption. Do you have a problem with the idea of, of you know, that, that as naturalism as a... I have a problem with what he just said, I think. Do you, Cam? Uh, he's saying that we, um, should, we shouldn't come to naturalism as, a, as a, an assumption, but technically the presupposition that the universe actually exists is a, an assumption. It's Right, but it doesn't include that the universe has no supernatural entities, right? That's true. So it, it's sort of like almost agnostic about what the universe contains. It's more like a realism in the sense that the universe is there. Okay. An explanation of, you know, the, something we arrive at through a process of reasoning and looking at the, the world around us, Luke. Well, I, th that's a perfectly intelligible claim, and and it's one that Sean abs he's, he's he's absolutely right. He sets that out in the book. He makes an argument. There's there's no unexamined assumptions there. He's he's right in the thick of it. So I I, I agree with all of that. I disagree with the con conclusion, of course. But there are there are he, he there's no there's no assumption of naturalism in the book. It's something he he argues to. There's no assumption that uh, will science will just answer all our questions. There's nothing else left to do. That, that there is a sort of philosophical argument there. I mean, well. I'm guessing from the way you're speaking, though, what you're finding Sean's approach quite refreshing here, because I assume you've heard too many times science is naturalism or something that that they're, the two are kind of somehow, you know, that that the, the two are perfectly equated in some way. That if you're committed to the scientific method, you're committed to naturalism by default or something. Yeah, I have heard that that view that 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 the, we don't. It, it comes up actually from a lot of scientists who are atheists who then decide that they need to attack philosophy, which is not something that Sean does. But they, you do see that view. I do. And and they will simply uh, you know attack philosophy as if there's nothing else to do. We'll just keep doing science. And that's are, you, are you willing to name a name of it? <laughs> uh, well, well, I mean, um, um, there, there were attacks against philosophers by uh, Lawrence Krauss and Neil deGrasse Tyson. And um, even even Stephen Hawking, someone as eminent as and as Pine him, Creek, saying that you know, philosophy is dead and philosophy can mess you up and ph philosophers are moronic and these sorts of things. But but that's not that the, you know, Sean is much more careful and sophisticated than that. Do, do you think people who do kind of dismiss philosophy um, and say all we need is science um, are making mistake yourself, Sean? Oh yeah, no, absolutely. I think that uh, it, it's kind of a hilarious mistake in, in the sense that none of these people and, and a lot of them are just speaking casually right i mean they're sort of joking around like when stephen hawking says philosophy is dead stephen hawking knows perfectly well that that's going to sell books <laughs> he likes <laughs> riling people up a little bit okay and literally two sentences later he's making philosophical claims just as much as any other philosopher and i think that he kind of knows that and he's being a little naughty and i wish he wouldn't do that but it's not completely as unsophisticated as it as it comes off um, I do think that there's, there's a closely related issue here that gets mixed up in people's minds, which is maybe worth uh, teasing out, which is there's this idea called methodological naturalism, which I, is usually defined as the idea that when science tackles a question, science is only allowed to suggest naturalistic explanations that the way that science moves forward is by assuming that naturalism is true, whether or not it is true, but mm. what science does is look for the natural explanations. Now, I think, number one, this is false. That's not actually what science does. I think that science looks for the true explanations. And number two, I think that this is a attempt to do something politically savvy, especially here in the United States, but failing even on that score. This is this idea of methodological naturalism, as much as anything else, grew out of the idea that we shouldn't be teaching creationism in schools. So it was an attempt to define what you teach in science class to preclude supernatural explanations from the start. So I think that it was sort of bad politics and bad philosophy at the same time. What, what, Do you agree with that, Doug? No. Methodological naturalism, like I think so uh, I, I do I tend to agree with that. The, the discussion between Neville. Maybe we should talk about it. Uh, so why, why, why don't you agree with that? Like, do you think that you should hold to methodological naturalism? 
Yeah, until you have a reason not to. <laughs> is that well? Is that unfair? Remember, mythological naturalism is like a like an approach, like an epistemology. It's you know only considering natural explanations as a part of science. What would happen if we wouldn't uh, uphold that methodological naturalism? Well, I think that things would look largely the same because it turns out that for everything that we have given like very successful accounts for thus far, they have turned out to be natural entities and natural processes. Now, that's not to say that all things that need explaining will turn out to be that way, but I, I suspect that things would proceed largely the same. Right. And see, I think a lot of Christians, Muslims, Jews, whatever, are against, uh, you know, just... If there's a God out there, and if we want, if he wants um, me to believe in him, he can interact in the natural world, and we can use uh, that interaction as evidence for him. So I don't see the problem with just saying we're going to keep that the scientific method to even arrive at a higher confidence level that this deity exists. Like if no Christian in the world ever got cancer. That would exactly or like Christian prayer in a scientifically measurable, like an empirical way, you know, had a, a beneficial um, impact over, you know, just other natural explanations. And we still use the scientific method to, you know, determine that, like, is it true that no Christian ever gets cancer? Well, we could. So but in that sense, doesn't that mean that you that you don't adhere to methodological naturalism because you are willing to like allow science like supernatural hypotheses to be investigated no uh well then maybe um i'm misunderstanding what sean carroll's saying like it, all i'm saying is that we should use the scientific method to arrive at let's say a higher confidence level in our beliefs So if there is a God or not, <laughs> or not, <laughs> yeah, if the beliefs are false, but well, so for example, if you have um, somebody who claims that the right explanation for their being able to uh, predict successive coin flips to an accuracy greater than 50%, like if they claim the explanation is they're getting you know, communication from some um, supernatural entity. Do you think, like, we should test them? <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, just have a large enough sample size, and uh, that may indeed... Like, remember uh, D Darren Brown, he did 10 heads in a row. He f literally, without deception, without video tricks, he flipped 10 heads in a row. But yeah, except he actually flipped it like thousands of times, <laughs> but he actually flipped it like 1040 times. And it took him. Well, what did he say? 13 hours of doing nothing but flipping. He was dead tired at the end of it. And if you do their math, that's it turns out to be about right. Uh, two to the um, 10th power is 1024, right? Or something like that. So, um, you got to kind of defy the math, I guess, in order for my company. So, so you don't think coming to supernatural conclusions is outside of the scope of the scientific method? Like, if it were actually the case that there was this supernatural thing going on, you don't think that concluding that it's going on is outside of the scope of science? Correct. I, I would say that you could have your, con I wouldn't use the word concluding, con concluding means, I, you can conclude something, still Tentatively concluding. Yeah, you can. Tentatively. Yeah, right, right. So you can, Provisional. you can conclude something and still be wrong. So if we went to 10 different countries in the world and had 10 different amputees and every, every religion rep represented it, 
and prayed for or did something to try to get these amputees to get their limbs back, and only the Christians succeeded. I tell you, I don't care if there's an atheist out there who says, oh, no, that, you know, we can't conclude God. But we can conclude something that is going on here, and your confidence would be raised that, hey, we have no explanation for this. That doesn't mean there's a God, of course, but it seems like there's something really amazing going on. And I don't care who you are. I think your confidence would be raised in some immaterial existence because we're talking about material just appearing. Something from nothing right in front of your own eyes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that would almost certainly lead me to believing in the Christian God. Well, we should probably continue now. In Australia or America or the UK. But I, I that... I don't subscribe to mythological naturalism. From a from my worldview, there there are natural things, and if we watch natural things closely enough, we'll see the laws that they obey, and that is simply the scientific method. It's it's not that I think all explanations will be scientific ones, but what I'm trying to discover about the world is how natural stuff works. I want to know how electrons work, and so I watch electrons. Yeah. Look, we're going to go to our first break a little early, but the good news is um, we're going to give the whole of today's program over to this discussion because uh, when you get Luke Barnes and Sean Carroll on the same program, you might as well give all your time to it. So um, uh, I'm really looking forward to today's discussion. We sort of laid the ground a bit with the, the worldviews um, that each here is defending in terms of naturalism and uh, a theistic explanation for the universe. Um, and we're going to be talking about, you know, some of the cosmology that has been used by some um, theologians to suggest that there is a divine cause of the universe and that there's a philosophy that goes alongside that. Uh, the fine tuning of the universe as well is something we'll be doing. And uh, can I encourage you, if you haven't read either of them, to get hold of Luke's book, A Fortunate Universe, and of course, The Big Picture by Sean Carroll as well. They're my two guests on the program today. One's an atheist, one's a Christian. And we're asking what is the best explanation of the universe, God or naturalism? And we'll be back in just a moment's time. Hello and welcome to the pro to point to a universe which appeared to have this extraordinary quality of, of having, um, in a sense, uh, if you wound the clock back, you would find it becoming hotter and denser to a, um, you know, what many people d determine a singularity, a, a boundary to space and time. Well, some people, you know, go as far as to call a beginning, if you like. Um, and that, that uh, in a sense, Got a lot of people excited about the possibility. Sure. You know, is this the equivalent of a, uh, a creation ex nihilo and so on? Um, it could could God be uh, the explanation for this? I, I mean, I don't want to put words into your mouth, though. So where 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 do you approach this as a physicist, as in someone who obviously does believe in the possibility, Luke, of a, of, of a divine creator ultimately behind the universe? So I, I think there are some very interesting clues, and they're they're at that level. It, it's kind of interesting that over the last, say, 80, 90 years of cosmology that uh, some some cosmologists who were trying to understand how the universe worked looked very hard at their models and found that in those models there was something that looked an awful lot like a cosmic beginning, a, a point you couldn't extrapolate back past mm. in, in time. Now, there's been an awful lot of back and forth in science then. People have you know, uh, tried to, to, to take that out of the beginning, put it back in the beginning. There's There's all sorts of things coming into play there. What, what really interests me as a cosmologist is, is there's a great big question mark at the beginning of the universe where we, we're not quite sure what's going on, but there's a lot of things that point to a beginning. But if you're a naturalist, if there was a beginning in the universe, you just have to say that the universe just came into existence and that's all there is to it as a, as a, a brute fact, mm. if there was a beginning. And I think that's, that's something that worries me a lot about naturalism. So before we come back to Sean on this, um, are you essentially saying that you're theistic out, outlook, as it were, is more consistent, um, sort of carries better with, with the evidence from science on this front than, as far as you can see, a naturalistic, brute factish kind of ness of the universe does. What I'd say is, if it turns out that our best cosmological ideas make it more likely than not that the universe has a beginning, that's something that I could personally, it wouldn't keep me up at night, <laughs> in the same way that the entire universe popping into existence out of nothing might keep a naturalist up at night. It's another question whether we have those clues. I think we do, but Sean will have his view on mm -hmm. that, and there's every cosmologist will have their views on that. Yeah, I mean, we, we're going to be sim simply grazing the surface of what is a huge area here, Sean. Um, but do you want to sort of briefly spell out why, in your view, we don't have to jump to any 
kind of supernatural conclusions, um, even though, you know, we, a lot of what the cosmology tells us looks something like a, a beginning to the universe. Yeah, uh, well, as you indicate, there are lots of issues uh, to talk about here. Uh, let me just see if I can remember everything that popped into <laughs> my mind over the last 10 minutes. Uh, number one, no, I don't think that I'm especially bothered by the existence of brute facts in a physicalist or naturalist account of a universe with a beginning. I think that theistic accounts also have brute facts. And I know that most theists disagree with that because they try to argue that something like God is a necessary uh, part of the universe, not just a brute fact that could have been there or not. And that's an actual intellectual disagreement. I do not think that God or anything else counts as a necessary part of the world. Um, number two, there's this very, very difficult time we have in talking about the idea that the universe had a beginning. It is almost impossible to resist using locutions like Luke just used about the universe popping into existence. Mm. But I really, really want to try to avoid using those kinds of phrases because it gives the impression that there was something called nothingness. And then there was this temporal process by which the universe came into existence, which you know, no one really thinks that that's true. So there's no sense in which the universe. Except for theists. <laughs> something else. that's that's true yeah this one is um, i'm glad that sean did um touch on it so directly because it is a frustrating thing to hear repeated despite people like william lane craig and luke barnes being told on numerous occasions that and even knowing better that that kind of language is misleading why is that language misleading let's spell it out well, just as Sean, well, I mean, I think Sean Carroll just adequately um, explained why it's misleading. Well, there's, t there's two reasons. Like one, within uh, cosmology currently, it isn't settled at all by any stretch whether or not time actually came into existence with the Big Bang. So general relativity... Um, uh, would lead you to believe that because uh, the solutions to the GR, GR um, models, like, for example, the Boyd Agurth Vilenkin theorem, do say that it came into existence. But most physicists are aware that a combination of quantum mechanics and general relativity will be required to make that kind of conclusion hold. Um, that you can't just isolate, sorry, analyze it within GR alone now the other problem is that even within gr like it's false to speak of there being like a time before and then a time after in which the universe first didn't exist and then second did exist um and the part i think part of the uh way in which uh william lane craig in particular gets away with using that language is that he holds to this view called the a theory of time um which interestingly most physicists don't actually hold um which allows him to talk about temporal becoming in the way he does can i try to summarize it in plain english <laughs> it's um when first of all uh, I'm just going to pick on the Christians. Sorry, Christians. Uh, Christians get so excited when they hear the universe has a beginning because then they can say, look, Genesis is right. Oh, isn't this amazing? Um, but the whole problem with saying that the universe, in, which is space, matter, and time, that a lot of people say, uh, had a beginning is you can just ask the question, well, was there a time when there wasn't a universe? And of course, Doug, because it... what. You know, they, it starts to hit them that, oh, if you say that the universe had a beginning, well, what happened just before that? That whole concept of time gets really messed up. And what uh, Cam is saying, uh, William Lane Craig says, well, but there's time and in a temporal sense where you have consciousness and things happening sequentially in a way. I think that's what William Lane Craig argues. And so that's why he says there has to be a personal God. But notice, Christians, when William Lane Craig says this, that there's time in a temporal sense, 
Your God, then, is bound by time, in a temporal sense. Yeah, so it might seem really unfair for us to be talking about William Lane Craig as yes, if Luke rid of him. <laughs> holds his views. But the reason why I brought it up is because William Lane Craig uses that phrase, the universe just popping into existence, just like Luke Barnes did um, earlier. And I don't know whether or not it originated with Craig, but uh, r regardless, it's like it's a specifically designed phrase to make it sound implausible, um, especially for lay people. And I think it's frustratingly what do you think of this? dishonest. What do you think of this? Like, to, to phrase it as our reality had a beginning. Like our universe, small u, not capital U, with its known constants and physical laws had a beginning. But before the Big Bang, we know nothing. Um, is that fair to say? Uh, I mean, I think it would depend on who you asked. Like, so some cosmologists think that time is eternal and what we're seeing with our Big Bang is effectively like a, a local event past which we can't, um, can't see anything and in particular our equations break down. Because, um, because but, the reason why I ask that is yeah, it, it, do we have, uh, like, I don't know how many pastors, I've apologists I've heard to, well, they'll just say, well, you know, they expect us to believe that there was nothing and then poof, now we have something. But that's not really what the Big Bang is all about. That's not what it's saying. All it's saying is the Big Bang is the beginning of the expansion of our reality, which we call universe. But that doesn't necessarily mean that if there's something before the Big Bang that we don't know about, that's also part of the universe. So really, it's not the beginning of the universe, capital U, but the beginning of the universe, small u. Well, so that's the thing is that within uh, general relativity, my understanding is that the conclusion you just said doesn't follow actually does follow. So if, if you take general relativity to be, uh, you know, the physical laws of the universe and ignore quantum mechanics, like you can get pretty strong results that say that time had a beginning. Um, which would, you know, rule out your comment that, but yeah. But quantum doesn't rule it out. That's what you're saying. Pops into existence, even if it has a beginning. I'd like to just stick to saying the universe has a beginning in, in these models. It may or may not be the correct cosmological model, but a universe with a first moment of time or a beginning. And finally, I think that as a, as a naturalist, the thing to do is to say, you know, given the, the evidence that we have of how the laws of physics work, given what we do know about the universe, which is certainly not enough to definitively say what happened at the beginning, does it seem plausible that the universe had a beginning? Does it seem plausible that time had a first moment? And right now it's plausible. We have perfectly sensible looking frameworks in which that would be the case but we're very far from saying that it actually is the case it's equally plausible that the universe has lasted forever do you agree that that's just as plausible a way of seeing the universe that, that it's, it's eternal in some some way luke so I, I do think it is is plausible like sean says but there is a great big question mark as as, as i said the thing that really bothers me about this and sean's right about the popping into existence you're like it's very hard it's very hard to talk about cosmology at all to be honest so you, you really got to work hard. But certainly talking about a beginning is very difficult. Uh, what really bothers me is if it, the best scientific conclusion we had was that the universe had a beginning, then what the naturalist would have to say is that the, the whole of uh, reality as it actually exists, right? and if this is true in the model uh, of, of reality, simply had a beginning and there's no reason why it came into existence and there's nothing else to say about what exists other than the universe that, that there would just be a brute fact that for no reason the whole of physical reality uh had a beginning point however you you want to say it i don't i'll, I'll try not to say popped in yeah <laughs> you can all say that in your own head in, at home <laughs> That's what bothers me. If naturalism was true, I'd have to say something like that. It's just sort of stare down the entire existence of the universe without 
and and d- try not to 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 think that hang on there must be some reason why the universe exists mm. could you stop there Doug? goes back to so two things on that i mean psychologically i've never quite understood why uh somebody like luke was so concerned about that being a problem for the universe um, but not concerned about it being a problem for God. And I know that that's like this really kind of basic atheist objection, like, oh, well, you know, what explains God? And of course, like uh, natural theology, theology considers God a necessary being. But it seems that like it's just a curiosity stopper. Like there's no particular um, non like axiomatic or like just simply a, a prior asserted reason why God wouldn't also need an explanation. But further to that, like this concept of um, things occurring and always needing an explanation, it's problematic because most Christian theists believe in libertarian free will, in you know, which is a, a scenario where there aren't explanations for why one choice was made out of others and like it's just a brute fact but they have no problem with that yeah uh so what you're saying is that if if a christian or a muslim or a jew says well okay let's say the universe did just pop into existence well why what's the reason um why don't they ask that same question about free will why? Why did you choose one thing over another? Is it really just a decision, a choice that just popped into existence? Or was there causal factors before? it? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, and there's also naturalist accounts of um, that make the same move as the necessary being move that the theist plays. So there are forms of mathematical Platonism where it's argued that the universe is just identical to this necessary mathematical entity. And so it's not as if like naturalists don't have a similar move to play if they really want to. It's just that they don't tend to do that because they don't believe you can just call things necessary and then be done with it. They're interested in actually trying to find genuine explanations. Yeah. And I, I, uh, to my chagrin, play that game when I'm talking to precepts, precept Calvinists. Whatever they say, well, God's necessary, I'll say, well, the universe is necessary. Um, it just is. My God's eternal and outside of time. Well, my universe is eternal and outside of time. You know, bef- not this universe, that our reality, but the one that came before it. Well, where's your evidence for that? Well, where's your evidence for yours? We just go back and forth. It's like, if you, <laughs> it's just a big game. Uh, but it's pretty silly. Yeah. You know, pre before the kind of cosmological theories that we're familiar with today, where philosophers like Leibniz are talking about, you know, the the idea that, you know, why is there something rather than nothing, um, you know, and his in a sense cosmological argument was, you know, that and delved into this idea that of given that the universe appears to have every um, in every sense is a contingent thing, didn't have to exist. Mm. Um, that the, it must have a cause in something that is not contingent, i.e. necessary. And that's where this idea of, of God is a necessary being. Now, um, you look like you wanted to come back on, you know, what Sean had to say there about, you know, he's not, he doesn't buy this idea of God as being the one necessary thing. Um, and obviously, Sean specifically spoke of God as part of the universe or, or whatever. Um, I mean, do, do you, I mean, this is where obviously the physics starts to cross over into the philosophy and the metaphysics and so on. Um, but, but for you, is this kind of, you know a natural kind of conclusion for you that that you have to go beyond the kind of brute fact of the existence of a physical realm to that, that it seems like there needs to be something that that is a cause of that particular realm well maybe i could put it this way uh i i think I, th- I think a good principle to go with it would be if you can explain something then do explain it as a, as a, just an epistemic starting point rather than 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 something deeper or ontological or that so what I see from a necessary being is there's a chance here to explain why anything at all exists. And if we can make sense of that explanation, even if it's not completely understood, 
right? I'm, I'm not going to say I totally understand what, what philosophers are talking about when they talk about necessary beings. But if I can see value to that explanation, then there's an awfully large fact about reality, the fact that it exists, which which we could understand in some way. And if you can explain something, then do. Okay. Sean, how do you want to respond to this? Because obviously for you, um, the fact that Luke says you're kind of just satisfying yourself with the brute fact of the existence of physical reality um uh, and you say well christians are just as much lumped with the brute facts themselves and when it comes to god um you, you you're just not convinced that you need to have an explanation beyond what we can physically observe in terms of the universe i'm more or less completely convinced that we are always going to bottom out our series of explanations that they will end somewhere uh in fact i think that what is called for here is a more nuanced idea of what an explanation is. And I think that, you know, as, as Luke said, there is this temptation, there's this feeling like, you know, there must be explanations for things. And I think that in the context of modern science, modern physics, that's not the right way to think. I think that we need to think about what you mean by an explanation. There's different kinds of explanations. When we get into things like the causes of things and so forth, there's a very, very different picture we have in modern physics than sort of the folk understanding of explaining why your car died. Well, it's because it ran out of gas, right? Uh, and I think that it's a different way of thinking about things at the, at the deepest level that has been very, very successful to modern science and in some sense, it's a much more straightforward, simple demand. It's find the laws of physics, find the patterns that nature seems to obey and ask what things could happen that are consistent with those patterns and what things would not happen that are not consistent with those patterns. The language of causes and explanations is inappropriate when we're talking about the fundamental nature of reality. So in, from that perspective, there's zero bother or worry in my mind that the universe can exist. Things are going to exist. The question is, are, do things obey the laws of nature? And this is often the issue that's, that's brought up when, for instance, you know, popular sort of uh, argument um, in apologetics is the Kalam cosmological argument, which you've obviously debated with William Lane Craig, um, where it, I guess your view is you simply can't speak of a cause of the universe when you get to that kind of quantum level of reality where that you know you because you can't talk of causes when you're going beyond the, the the boundary of time and so on that these concepts break down is that kind of where you're going with this sean as i understand it yeah i mean just a, a very tiny little uh gloss on that would be that you don't have to talk about causes in that context there's always the very very real possibility that we don't understand everything about the universe maybe what we see is the universe is part of some much larger framework whether it's a multiverse or something even beyond that and within that framework one can talk about causes but uh if the universe is the whole of, of physical reality then talking about causes looking for causes would be inappropriate and I think that it is exactly parallel to the idea of, you know, could the universe have had a first moment of time? When I was debating William Lane Craig, he was incredulous that I could imagine both that the universe had a first moment and that it was uncaused. And his argument was basically like, if universes can just pop into existence, then why don't bicycles pop into existence? And the point is, well, we have perfectly good explanations for that. Bicycles popping into existence would violate the laws of physics. It would violate laws of conservation of energy and momentum and things like that. The question to ask is, would a universe having a first moment of time violate the laws of physics? To the best of our current understanding, the answer is no. Is that your best understanding, Luke? And why would you defer from what Sean has to say there? Well, yeah, let, let me just jump in on that. So it's very interesting. So... The reason why bicycles don't jump into exist uh, don't pop into existence, there's that phrase again, uh, is is because it would violate the laws of physics. No, but uh, Sean, am I right? You, you think the laws of physics are just ways of talking about the events in the universe? There's just the stuff that happens. There's they're called the Humean expect. There's the Humean perspective. There's there's the set of events of stuff that happens, and then we find a useful way of summarizing those, and that's the laws of physics. Is that basically your view of the laws of physics? Yeah, that's pretty close. That's fine. Right. So in that case, uh, it, it, the laws of physics don't do any. Well, I mean, what do you mean violate the laws of physics? It's not like the, the laws of physics. Are, you, you don't have a governance view, right? It's not the case that there are the, the laws of physics really are something that do things like, like you know, 
that 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 matter has certain properties, certain causal properties, and in the interactions with those, that's what makes the laws of physics hold in our universe. You don't believe in fundamental causal properties, and so the the, the laws of nature have no power there. Or you, you, there are just what? Why aren't we in a universe in which it is the case that bicycles do just pop into existence? It's not because of the laws. Or what would happen in that universe is you would have to have you, you would have to say something like the 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 best summary of the universe I have is here's the equations of quantum field theory. Oh, by the way, on the tenth of October, a bicycle is going to pop into existence in in London. That would be your laws of nature. Yeah, that's right, and that's completely plausible uh, if that were what the evidence demanded. Happily, we have a much simpler theory, which is here are the laws of nature, and and that's it. And I think that's what our burden is as scientists, to find the best possible theory that explains what we see in nature. So I don't feel any need to grant the laws of nature any uh, coercive properties. They're a description of, of what happens. So the question about the origin of the universe or the beginning is compatible with the simplest descriptions of what we actually do see. Is it also possible the universe just had a beginning? Uh, if the answer were, you know, if, if there were a different answer, if there was sort of the laws of physics that we noticed by doing our experiments and our observations here on Earth, and that was somehow incompatible with the idea or, or some notion we really wanted to hold true about the beginning of the universe, then I would count that as evidence against that particular view of, of how nature behaved. Uh, so Luke is basically saying, um, William Lane Craig you know, how can you believe that something can just pop into existence? Like, why doesn't a bicycle well, bicycle pop into existence? And uh, Sean Carroll says, well, because we know the laws of the universe. We know the laws of nature. We know the laws of physics. And um, the laws are such that we don't, that's impossible. And Luke says, well, but if the laws of the universe were such that it was possible, then you would say, yeah, then it is possible. And Sean Carroll's saying, right. But that's not the universe we live in, is it? And um, am I summarizing it correctly, Cam? But some, you could actually imagine a universe. I, I, I think so. But you could imagine a universe, like um, if the multiverse theory is correct, where the laws of physics are different and where things could pop into existence. I think that's what Sean Carroll is kind of saying. And um, I think it's like, Understanding cosmology and quantum and all these things is like having your cat do calculus. It's like, for guys like William Lane Craig, it's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> well, I think it's partly because they're coming to the table with what I see as like folk psychology as the main driver of their metaphysics. And... I know that that sounds super complicated, but it's it, it's this, you know, we, we have these kind of categories and ideas in our head and like we see them as being in some way fundamental because whenever we look out in the world, like we see patterns conforming to them. But it turns out that like our best description of nature just doesn't use that language. Um, it doesn't use the language of cause and effect in the same way that we use cause and effect in the sense like if I drop this cup, it'll fall. It doesn't work like that. Um, and that's hard to understand unless you actually go and study physics. We need an explanation for why the universe exists. You'll hear that often said from many theists. But yet, again, this goes back to special pleading. Does, does the Yahweh... The concept of Yahweh, if Yahweh is real, does he ever, if he's a personal being with thoughts, does he ever wonder, why do I exist? Like, it seems like this, there's a special pleading that you have to have an explanation for the existence of the universe, but not for your God. Yeah, and uh, I mean, don't get me wrong, like, I, I think it is, like, virtuous to seek to understand things. And when things do actually have explanations, we, we should be pursuing it. And it can be very difficult to tell whether or not they do or don't. And to, to conclude that they don't 
have an explanation, I think is almost always going to be premature. Um, I think that what we're going to find is we just continue to provide better accounts of why things are the way they are at a fun, more and more fundamental level. And it might be the case that we hit rock bottom, but I don't think that we can demand that we that we will or that we want. Just that we have no evidence against them. the evidence that we have is all completely compatible with the idea that there are patterns in how nature behaves here around us, and those patterns are consistent with the universe having a beginning. Right, but remember the question. The question was, why aren't there more? If if there are brute facts like the existence of the universe. Why aren't there more brute facts? That was the question. And the, the question was, what, for example, why don't bicycles appear in this room right now? And it sounded like the answer you gave ultimately was, well, the, thankfully in our universe that doesn't happen. But that's not an explanation. If brute facts are allowed, why aren't there more of them? And if the, the real problem is if you allow brute facts, they don't have reasons. And so there can't be a reason why there aren't more brute facts or less brute facts or only universes are brute facts rather than bicycles being brute facts. You, so the, the objective. So, and I mean, I don't know Luke's views here, but I mean, the thing that comes to mind is that a lot of theists genuinely believe that in the world, there are brute facts going on all the time. In, in the decisions of our will. I mean, that's my understanding of libertarian free will. And you can find even like very sophisticated theologians who hold that position. And that's the way that they talk about it. They, they would say that there isn't a particular reason why one outcome comes over another. And this, like, I'm not caricaturing them. There will probably be people who don't agree with my characterization of it, but there are many, many sophisticated theologians and this is philosophers good. that do think that that's the way it works. Substitute free will choice with the bicycle. Really, what Cam is saying is the same thing. If... If you're saying, well, why, if you believe in free will, you got to ask yourself, okay, why don't bicycles just pop into existence? And we'll say, well, that's just, you know, how our universe works. If you're a theist, if you can admit that, uh, that just doesn't regularly happen. Um, well, now apply that to your own choices. If you believe in free will, that they just pop into existence, that you have the steak, you have the lobster, I choose lobster. <laughs> It's like, did that just pop into existence or was there causal factors that led up to it? Just like there's causal factors in the construction well, you, of a bike. You usually think they think that there are some causal factors, but they don't think that those causal factors ultimately explain the choice among options. Mm, just like 99%. Like, it, like there's a story that... Yeah, there's a story that you can tell about neurons firing in the brain, but they don't think that that is the ultimate story. There, there's some, in the, yeah, I mean, it's a very incoherent concept, so it is kind of hard to talk about, but but my understanding is that they do consider them to be brute facts. The question here is that once you've allowed, once you've opened the door to brute facts, you can't then stop, the, you know, the whole party piling in. It, it's a clown car. Everything's going to come flying out. Why aren't there more brute facts? The fact that there aren't more brute facts the fact that there is a simple way of describing the universe in which there's no bicycles that pop into existence is the thing to be explained. Yeah, but it, it may not have an explanation. I don't think we have a right to demand an explanation for that. I think that the fact that there are very few brute facts is a brute fact. But I don't think that right. brute facts yeah. are things we open a door to. I think that you absolutely can't avoid that. It is a, a happy fact of the universe that we seem to live in that there's a very simple set of rules that it seems to obey. If you just want to say, well, why is it that way? I'm just going to say that's how it is. And there's, there's, there's no hope of, once we understand the ultimate laws of physics, asking for more than that. Yeah, we both wanted to so pause. I, <clears throat> so, I mean, I kind of disagree with Sean Carroll here. Like, I think that we should be optimistic about the possibility that we can explain it in some more fundamental way. And I don't think that we should just say, okay, we can't, so we'll just stop at this point. And he's not saying that we can't. But, 
you can't demand that there is an explanation a priori. It's that I think that is part of what he's saying, but he he's not saying it in a very clear way. I, I'm I just understand Sean Carroll saying, "Hey, um, there may not be a why, and we should be okay with it. Yeah. We, should, we should man up." Uh, I think that's what I'm hearing him say, and I I think if I was to uh, guess about his motives for why he's actually even talking this way is because theists, Christians, Muslims, they don't ask these same questions about the nature of their God. Why is God's nature the way it is and not some other nature? Is it arbitrary? Like, what's the brute facts about the nature of their God? Why do we have so few? Do we have few or do we know it all? Um, so everything Sean Carroll or everything that Luke is demanding of the universe, you could demand of the nature of the deity he believes in. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that there are a lot of properties of God that theists don't argue are derivative or like caused by some other deeper explanation. Okay, can I just jump in quickly? You said uh, we don't have a right to demand an explanation. When do we have the right to demand an explanation? Well, in the context of some bigger picture, right? So we, ha we, we say we explain why bicycles don't pop into existence because there's something called conservation of energy momentum. And then you say, well, why is there conservation of energy momentum? Well, because the laws of physics have this property that there are certain symmetries. Why do they have that property? Well, I don't know. That's just it. That's that's the bottom, right? I think that there's absolutely no way out of hitting a bottom at these of these chains of explanation. Whereas you, Luke, appear to be open to the idea that we haven't hit rock bottom when we get to the fundamental laws of of physics um, uh, of reality. You you think that it's perfectly feasible to say we don't have to assume a brute fact here about reality. We we can say this this could could have an explanation beyond itself in in God, in an, in something that is necessary in that sense of, I guess you, you, dif, di, you know, digress from the way Sean sees mm. it, that God's just another brute fact. Um, you, you don't see God it, having quite the same kind of explanation, um, it's sort of, ex, it's a different kind of explanation, presumably to just, just that there is a universe in that sense. Right. So, so here's a way I like to explain it. Suppose that, 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 physicists we we totally nail this universe right we solve the crossword puzzle it's all done <laughs> we're, we're staring at a blackboard in which the ultimate principles of reality are in fact written now how we'd know that is another question entirely but suppose you know albert einstein's great 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 granddaughter alberta has written them on the board for us and we're all just staring at them um it, the the question is whether i mean certainly f first in, implication is 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 we all high five because that would be a <laughs> phenomenal achievement but the, the the question then is whether we would be okay with just saying that's the ultimate principles reality if you have any more questions that try to go deeper than the blackboard just swallow them and 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 like we've reached the end that's all or is 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 there questions raised by the blackboard which you would still want answers to like why is there a universe which is described by the stuff on this blackboard why is there you know stuff at all why does it obey scientific laws at all why is it you know particularly presumably rather elegant beautiful mathematical principles so i so maybe yeah so what sean is saying i think uh, correct me if i'm right is, is we'd get to the end we'd look at that blackboard and we go high five we're all done if you've got any further questions well we've bottomed out so just deal with it Whereas I think you know, if you can explain something, do if there's a level of explanation which can help us understand why that blackboard and why all those other questions, we should go for it. I, I mean, can I just jump in with a question maybe for you, Sean, which is um, one of those examples, which I, I find fascinating, um, but I don't think gets talked about often enough, actually, is is the the elegance of the physical sort of geometry of the universe, the mathematics that, you know, Eugene Wigner did. Again, I just want to, like what Luke just said, you let's say you could explain the whole universe and write it, write it down on a blackboard and you look at it and you just, it's an existential question. Like Luke is, is really pulling on the, I think the evolutionary existential needs in humans to know why, why, why? But again, it's a special pleading of sorts because they do not require the same why, why, why for their God. 
Like, why exactly is their God that they believe in the way it is? Why is their God even existing? Right. Well, which is uh, what I was pointing out earlier is that I think there's some kind of psychological, uh, there's some kind of interesting psychological question here of why it is that it feels like God is a answer for which those types of questions are irrelevant. Um, Because I don't think it's justified simply by the concept or by asserting that it's a necessary being. But I don't know whether Sean will get a chance here, but I thought it's, it was unfortunate he was characterized as closed. If you had all of those equations written up on the on the blackboard and you would realize that for all empirical phenomena, those equations were the explanation for why you observed it. I don't think that Sean is saying, and I, I might be wrong about this, but I don't think that Sean is saying that he's closed to the possibility there might be a deeper explanation for why those equations over another. He's just saying that um, if you find it very difficult to find a deeper explanation and you, you know, pursue the attempt to find a deeper explanation, but you don't find an adequate one, you first of all, don't just get to assert that something else is the explanation for it and have that get a free ride. Um, But you also don't get to demand of the universe that it must have an explanation. Like, you still leave on the table that it's possible that it might not. Right. Yeah, the universe owes you nothing. (laughs) Just by the, you know, the extraordinary effectiveness of mathematics and so on. Um, which I have heard, um, you know, theologians and, and philosophers, uh, you know, theistic philosophers use again as um, a, a sort of consistency with a theistic worldview that uh, we would expect to find that kind of a beautiful symmetry of equations and so on. Um, and but on, I guess, again, on a naturalistic view, it's just a brute fact. It's just a, a kind of extraordinarily lucky coincidence that we happen to live in a universe that's so eminently discoverable and, um, you know, that we can plot on with a pen and paper and so on. And where do you land on that? Do you just sort of have to say it's well, it, it just is the way it is, and we're very fortunate? Um, or would I mean, do you see that there's a legitimacy in, I guess, what what Luke is saying, which is no, that that's begging and that that's crying out for some an explanation beyond itself? No, I actually I do think it's legitimate. I mean, I get it. I, I I certainly think that if there were explanations for some of the brute facts that we thought that we might have thought were just brute, then that would be better than not having explanations. The more simple you can bring things down to, the better off you are. Uh, the the important points I'm making are number one, I don't think anyone is avoiding the existence of brute facts, like it or not. And number two, which we haven't gotten to yet, I think that the actual use of God or theism as the grounding of the brute facts of the universe we observe does a very bad job. I don't think that it is what, I don't think the universe that we observe is in fact what would be predicted by that hypothesis. So I, like I said before, this is not a priori. I absolutely think it's worth we're getting somewhere. Like this possibility. I just don't think the evidence uh, is on its side. Take us down that road then, and um, why you believe that if someone wants to posit God as as an explanation, it it we we it actually doesn't help their case. If we're not in the kind of universe you you would expect if if there was a God behind the whole show. Yeah, I mean, I think this is actually the key point here that should be um, more focused on by people on both sides of this debate. I think that you're faced with these two competing ontologies: theism and naturalism. And your burden, if you want to decide which one is true, is to be very, very honest with yourself about what you would expect the universe to look like under each theory. And that's very hard to do because we know what the universe looks like to some extent, right? And if you favor one theory over the other, then inevitably you're going to say, yep, that's exactly what the universe (laughs) should look like under my theory. So personally, and and at at some level, uh, there's a problem just because on the theistic side, well, even on the, to be fair, even on the naturalistic side, 
predicting what the universe should be like is not at all straightforward. If you have a specific naturalistic model with actual individual laws of physics, then you can predict things. But just saying naturalism doesn't tell you much about what those individual laws could be. So you can imagine many, many different possibilities. And I think that in the case of theism, it's even worse because the kind of things that you get as a specific theistic model are far less constrained and rigorous and clear than they are in a specific naturalistic model. You may have noticed that there are theists in the world who disagree with each other about the nature of God, what God wants us to do, etc. And I think that if I try my best to be honest about what I'd expect the universe to look like uh, if God existed and had made it, then there's basically two choices. Either we human beings are important to God or we're not. If we were important, if we human beings had played some crucial role in the nature of the universe, to be frank about it, I expect the universe to be a lot smaller. We don't need uh, a universe anywhere near the enormity and immensity that we see. Uh, frankly, he would predict that the universe would be a lot smaller if a deity made the universe for us in mind, or that we are extremely important. This is exactly the, the thinking behind the flat earthers. I just thought I'd throw that in. Well, it's also the thinking behind what I see as much of the cosmology as presented in the Old Testament. Yeah. Like, if, if the idea of God that these people had in mind was a God that predicts and makes you expect what we observe, the incredible vastness of our cosmos, then they would have written that down. <laughs> but, I mean, of course, there has been a, con a conceptual change in who, what God is between now and then. But it just goes to show that, like, at face value, there doesn't seem to be any direct connection between a conception of God as held by, like, the, the Yahwist of the Old Testament and the... In immensity of our cosmos. I mean, us. Uh, we'll at some point get into fine tuning. I know that Luke is an expert on that, and I think that in some senses, the universe is way more fine tuned than we would ever expect it to be uh, just for human beings to exist. And to me, that's evidence that it's a physical mechanism that is explaining the fine tuning, not uh, a theistic explanation. So I think that, you know, if we're, if we're, trying to be honest uh, about what we would predict. Number one, it's very hard and I'm very sympathetic to people who disagree about it. But number two, I, I just don't see why we would live in this kind of universe if God had made it for us. We'll come back to these questions after a short break and uh, we're gonna do uh, another whole segment where we're gonna get into these issues. And I think this is a good point at which to transition as well into talking about the fine tuning of the universe as, as well in the final segment of today's program. Unbelievable. You can leave commenting aspect that he's written about in a book. And I suspect there are just some fundamental issues with with generally the God hypothesis that that, that Sean has as well um, in a general way as well. But um, I mean, this does take us into the realm of uh, the fine tuning of the universe. I mean, perhaps um, where do you want to begin? Do you want to begin with fine tuning and explain your kind of perspective on that or, or jump directly to some of those issues that, that Sean was laying out in that last section. Let me start with fine tuning very quickly here. Although Sean laid out the, the, the context quite well there. What would you expect if your theory was correct about the universe? And he was also very correct. That that's a very hard question to answer because <laughs> we kind of know the answer to start with. Um, but let me now don't let, don't let me get away without trying to answer those questions that Sean raised. They're okay. very important, but mm -hmm. let me just, just, as I understand it, how fine tuning sort of hits back the other way. So we're trying to think what sort of universe would we expect if naturalism was true? And the, the important thing here is uh, there are no equations of naturalism. If, if, all right, there's no, if, if I said natural stuff is the only stuff, and you said, all right, what sort of universe would you expect? The problem is that if naturalism is true, there's no answer to that. There's no deeper reason which informs that question. And so naturalism is what's called, this is a technical term in, in probability theory, it's called a, a non-informative theory. It's not supposed to be pejorative. It's just when, if, if, if my theory is that, that someone just guessed a 12-digit number, that doesn't tell me much about what number I guessed. So that's all it is. So here's how I think fine-tuning sort of addresses this question, how it's relevant. We're, we're trying to think through, okay, if, 
if there was just a naturalistic universe, just some universe, what sort of universe would we expect? Well, here's, here's a way we could try and answer that amongst the, all, all the possible naturalistic universes. Let's, let's take the deepest laws of nature that we have at the moment, because they're what we have, and let's try and look for a set of possibilities that sort of naturally arise in those laws and then look amongst that set of possibilities. So one of the things we could do, which I think is a reasonable thing to do, is say, okay, in those laws, we have what are called fundamental constants. Mm -hmm. Stuff like how heavy is an electron and um, something called the cosmological constant. There's, there's, there's numbers that appear that the best theories we have, they're just in the equations. We don't have any deeper understanding as to why they are what they are. Now, maybe, maybe later on we will understand that. But for the moment, they, they're what we've got. So trying to understand naturalism, let's just take those numbers change them in a way that's mathematically consistent within the theory in a way that we have to sort of understand that possibility, those possibilities mm -hmm. to test the theory at all anyway. And let's see if there's anything interesting about our sort of neighborhood, this universe, as opposed to other possible ways the universe could have been. This I, I'd suggest is the experiment that fine tuning kind of did sort of naturally <laughs> with, without this end in mind. So because naturalism, there's no, there's no deeper principles than the ultimate principles of nature. What you would, you sort of pick at random, so to speak, that's not literally true, but you, the, the sort of, you would, you would not expect one value of, of these parameters over any other. And so what, when fine tuning finds that this is just all in the scientific literature, that actually there would be dramatic changes in these other universes that actually the set, which allows the existence of any of the sort of complexity that would undergird, any form of life we can even begin to you know imagine things like can this basic stuff of the universe stick together like do the particles stick together will there be anything like structure in the universe that's a very small a ridiculously in fact small subset of the total mm -hmm. we have there a sort of test of what universe would you expect on naturalism and overwhelmingly because it's not informative about the ultimate laws and because the best sort of grip we can, what we'd love to do is just test every law we can think of and yet you know we, we can't that, that's a bit so this this within this sort of test problem we have let's change these constants the set you know if you say what would you expect overwhelmingly you would expect a universe which didn't do anything remotely like the complexity we see in our universe so that i think to to ridiculously small numbers the the probabilities that come out are, are mm. rather small that's how I think this tries to answer that question. What would you expect on naturalism? So, and just to reiterate, for those who <clears throat> maybe, uh, and I can encourage. Do you have any idea what that rambling was all about? <laughs> yeah, I do. Is he basically saying uh, that it, the universe is such that it's so finely tuned, if we change the parameters a little bit, what do we? What would we expect? And I think he didn't come out and say, it, but he would expect we wouldn't be here. Um, so w what he's no, what he's saying there is something like more technical than that. He's saying that like imagine that you have a blackboard, and on that blackboard you write out all of the possible iterations of like equations or something like that that are consistent with naturalism. What he's saying is naturalism by itself, nothing else included, just effectively the idea that everything will be natural. It doesn't pick out any one of those equations over any other one. So you can write on the board billions and billions and billions and billions of equations that are consistent with naturalism. And so naturalism itself is like not determining which one you would expect. Okay, I understand that. But the point, the deeper point that he's trying to get at here is that requires, compels an explanation, right? Is now the purpose of why he even well, said that? I think what he's going to do is he's going to introduce another theory which does have more oh, content by the way cam, tries to by the way cam and i have yeah. not heard this before we're listening to this for the first time together so 
I am yeah, this is the first time we've heard this. Um, I think what he is going to do, I, I mean, I know this because I've actually watched some of his lectures before, but he effectively is going to introduce what he considers a theory that if you imagine all of those equations on the whiteboard actually does kind of isolate a smaller subset than the full full account of them. And in that way, he's saying that uh, theism is um, its evidence of theism, um, of the theistic model, because it tells you like what you're more likely to expect to see. And what you're more likely to expect to see is like a set of equations or like some kind of equations that are consistent with life existing because God wants life to exist. Okay, this is my very simple answer to that. And that is, I would ask Luke if he was here, well, are you saying then that your God is bound and limited by certain physical constants, certain laws of physics? Your concept of God is actually restricted, constrained by certain equations on that whiteboard. I think that's what I would say, and I don't know what he would say back to that, but let's play on. I encourage you to go and you know listen to some other programs that we've done in the past on fine tuning, but, but just to boil it down, it's this idea that, as you say, if you were to alter these fundamental constants and so on to the tiniest, you know, razor blade degree, um, you would not get a universe which could support life because you, you'd find a universe which was too thinly dispersed or um, where, you know, stuff couldn't bind together or, you know, you can't get galaxies, planets, chemistry going and that kind of thing. Um, and so we, we, we live in a very, in a sense, unusual, as you would put it, fortunate universe. Um, if naturalism is true, uh, it's not the kind of universe we would expect. We would expect a universe that is sterile uh, at some level in terms of its ability to produce life. If, if, if you know, naturalism was was the fundamental kind of thing thing at play. Um, okay, so so far, you know, so good in terms of describing the 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 question that mm -hmm. fine tuning raises in this regard. For you, Luke, God, theism is again consistent with what we find ourselves in the universe in which we do exist um and inconsistent with naturalism therefore therefore for you it's it's more it's, it's on the side of of a theistic explanation in that sense yeah so when sean raises those questions that they're, they're very good questions and i'm certainly not saying that you know i could i could sort of go into my cave and stare into the darkness and, and imagine a universe and get everything right um you know, given theism, it's just that when I try and weigh up those things, the the this test case of fine tuning says that naturalism, the 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 probability is so ridiculously small that actually these worries about how how you would predict something given God's existence don't don't compare. They are worries, but I can give them a, a probability of one in a billion, and still it it wouldn't much matter. Now, let me just clarify something quickly. It's not that I started off as an atheist, came to fine tuning, and then voila, I'm a Christian. It's I, you know, I'm, I'm a Christian. I, I, I grew, grew up that way. Uh, I, this is something that makes sense to me within this worldview I have. And when I try and sort of step over into the naturalist shoes and understand fine tuning, I think it would bother me more than you know. Okay. Than that. Um, okay, w w where do you want to take this from? And we will get to those questions that that Sean had about, you know, if God is the, an explanation, why why are certain aspects of our universe overly fine tuned, or is it too large, and so on? But but I mean, where where would you normally go with this, Sean? Do do you kind of just have a fundamental problem with God as an explanation, or would you take it down the well? There are other explanations out there, you know, and we can talk about the multiverse theory and, and all of that kind of thing. Where where do you want to go with it? Uh, yeah, I feel the need to say at least three things very quickly, and then we can sort of pick and choose which one to dive into. But okay. I actually, I don't, I'm not objecting to God as an explanation. I, I'm on the record as saying that the fine tuning argument is the best evidence we have for theism. I don't think it's very good evidence, but I do think it is the best. It's a, it's a more uh, respectable argument than the other ones that are out there. Uh, having said that, three quick things. Number one, I, I don't come anywhere close to accepting that we know that the parameters are finely tuned. I, I certainly accept that, you know, uh, it, it would be 
It, it's plausible that that's true. I just don't have any confidence in our ability to know what the universe would be like if we changed the constants of nature, even a little bit, much less a lot. Certainly, I don't think that if we were just given the constants of nature, we could predict the kind of universe we have. So I'm not at all confident enough to say that if we change the constants of nature, we could predict a new kind of universe. So I'm not convinced that there is that kind of fine tuning. Maybe there is. I'm not denying it. I just want to be humble about that. Number two, I don't think that it suggests the existence of God in any way. The kind of fine tuning we're talking about is, if it does exist, the kind of fine tuning that is necessary for the existence of complex chemical reactions. If you think that life is a complex chemical reaction, then that makes perfect sense. But most theists don't think that. They think that life is something more than just a complex chemical reaction. So I'm not at all sure why God would fine-tune the concepts of nature to allow for these complex chemical reactions that we call organic beings. And finally, I think that naturalism does provide a much better explanation for it in the form of the multiverse, like you just said. And I think that that's true not only because it can, a multiverse can explain why we happen to find ourselves in a region of the cosmos that is hospitable to life, but the way in which our universe exists and is inhospitable to life is hospitable to life with all these other galaxies, with all these other parameters like the mass of the bottom quark that have nothing to do with life. That's the kind of universe you would expect in a naturalistic multiverse explanation for the fine tuning that allows complex structures. What? Yeah, I want to. Yeah, I want to. Get it, get it, get it. There's plenty for us to get going with right there. So why don't we we'll, we'll see what, what Luke has to say in response to those three three areas that you outlined very helpfully there. Um, firstly, not at all convinced it is there is a fine tuning thing here. We just don't know what that those universes would actually look like if we tinkered with the, uh, the, the the fundamental constants and so on. Luke, I mean, do, do, do you dis simply disagree that that we we can be pretty sure that we wouldn't get anything like what we know as as a life permitting universe? So I I I think we can be pretty sure. I don't think there. First of all, I don't think there can be an in principle problem here, because the questions we're asking are are just questions of theoretical physics, in a more complicated scenario because we're talking about life. But if the laws of nature were such and such, the outcome would be so and so. Is exactly what theoretical physics is about. So if if the cosmological constant were very large, then the universe would be mostly a sort of thin hydrogen suit with no galaxies, is the sort of statement that theoretical physics should be able to make. Now, so so the, the doubt must be, can't be an in-principle doubt, but an in-practice doubt. Now, I'm, I'm perfectly happy with humility about these sorts of things, but some of these cases are so clear that I don't think that's much of a problem. And and if, as far as I can tell, your author, uh, your co-author, Geraint, uh, fundamentally agrees with you, at least on at that level, that... that there is a phenomenon of fine tuning, it, whether or not it is a designed fine tuning. In, in that so, sense, yeah, I, I think he'd happily say something like, you know, if the cosmological constant had been to anywhere close to what you might call its natural value, something up at the Planck range, then then we wouldn't be here talking right now. Mm -hmm. There'd be no such thing as check one two. Check one, two. Oh, that's better now. Um, I was going to summarize Sean Carroll's basically argument against the fine tuning, or we can summarize it together. Uh, number one, Sean Carroll's point is we don't actually know, and we have even no real basis to have confidence on what exactly, how the constants could change, what would constitute life, what would change, how it would change life. Um, so basically that goes against everything an apologist says. Well, if we just change the constant a little bit, then X would happen. How do you know that? How confident are you that that's true? Because when's the last time we've been able to change a physical constant <laughs> and test it? Um, well, I mean, they do have ways of going about uh, figuring that out. Like they do, there are some theists, at least the ones that are physicists, who try to run sort of predictive simulations, sometimes computationally, but also other times just uh, via some kind of mathematical deduction. And they try to predict, you know, what 
would the effect be? Yeah, I understand that, but um, then it, it comes to the second point that Sean Carroll made is what exactly are, are you saying that if we change the, the parameters, the physical constants a little bit, you know exactly what kind of life can or cannot happen at that point? Like, do we know that? Yeah, and that's a, that's a great question. Like, so sometimes the changing of a constant will have such a dramatic effect that uh, life as we know it couldn't exist. But that's a very different question or a very different statement from saying that life of any form couldn't exist. And that's a much harder question to answer. Right. Um, because it, it's pretty much a given that there are changes you could make that would affect our form of organic chemistry from being able to operate that it's not quite as clear that there wouldn't be some form of uh, life that could arise um, but it's also not clear at least and i think that sean will probably get into this later it, it's not clear that we can just independently turn these dials and that represents the way in which they were selected um, so there's a premise here, which is that there are some kind of dials, some kind of constants, that they have a space of possible values, and each space of possible values among the different constants can be controlled independently. Um, that's not clear either. Some There have been examples in the past where it turned out that what we thought were independent physical constants were actually explained by the same mechanism. Okay. So, so again, that's another difficulty. Yeah, so, uh, and the last point he mentioned was the multiverse. And so, like what I was saying earlier with Dar Darren Brown, and he actually flipped 10 heads in a row without any cuts in the video. Um, but how did he do it? Well, he flipped the coin like 1,100 times or something like that and just waited until we got, had 10 heads in a row. So if you were to imagine these finely tuned constants, our universe that can sustain us as 10 heads in a row, well, if you have enough flips, you'll get it. And so that's the multiverse theory that if you have enough universes, you're, you're going to get it. And But instead of 10, it's probably going to be in the billions or trillions. Yeah, and... I mean, it is worth pointing out that multiverse models are um, not consensus. Like, you know, there's no strong consensus. Oh, what there is consensus about, at least, is that they're not um, motivationally derived by some kind of fine-tuning problem. They weren't invented for the purpose of explaining fine-tuning. They were actually invented for the purpose of explaining other phenomena that we need to account for in the in cosmology do you know what that phenomena is uh, so two ones uh, is the uh, the flatness problem um, and the iso isotropy of the early universe that that's my understanding at least the cosmological flatness problem so there are these observational things that um, cause us to create theories that have these properties and as well it's important to point out it's not like somebody is just sitting there in an armchair going oh you know what if there were many universes like wouldn't that be cool like wouldn't that be a neat idea this actually comes out of a mathematical model it's not a like an ad hoc um like, okay. you know, oh, you know, just let's just imagine that there were thousands of universes. <laughs> like, it's not like that. Oh, and it's not like, oh, you dirty, dirty atheists just don't, you just hate God. So therefore you came up with the multiverse theory. It's, it's not that either. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's not that. Okay. It was come up with on independent grounds. As words or books or people or conversation. Sure. But none of it, even if I grant you the fine tuning, says Sean, um, suggests God. Okay, where do you want to go with what he had to say about that? So the question of why would God fine-tune the universe, you know, I think most of us would think that at least that our life, whatever it is, is supported in some sense by complex chemical reactions. So it's what I need is the, all the fine-tuning needs is sort of the inverse of that. If there were not these complex chemical reactions, then there, would not, there wouldn't be natural life as the sort that we understand. 
Now, what you could say, what some people have say, well, even in a universe which wasn't fine-tuned, God could still make it the case that that matter does the things necessary for life. So God, mm -hmm. even in a universe where chemistry wasn't possible, God could make it possible by doing those sorts of things. God could simply bypass fine-tuning, in a sense. Right. The problem is, I don't think Sean can say that, and I'd love to get his view on this, because Sean, as we saw before, is a Humean. So we, what that means is that there's not two things. There's not the the way that the laws of nature are and, the, on the other hand, the way the universe actually behaves. Those are the same thing. So you cannot say that the universe, the laws of nature are such that the universe wouldn't support life, but the universe actually behaves in a way to support life. Though that's something that Sean can't say. Uh, uh, if I understand his view correctly, I'm sure he'll do that in a second. But more generally, I, th I think at least we can understand why God might want to create a universe in which the the way that 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 people interact with each other is via an external environment, which is predictable in some sense. Right? That's what gives us the the ability to influence each other's lives in a morally relevant way. We're not just did he just say he knows why God would do something? <laughs> why he would make something in a way? Uh, I'm not quite sure exactly who, exactly what he was saying. Yeah, I, I think he was saying um, that we can understand maybe why God would make the universe the way he did because then people could interact with each other in a certain way. I, I, to me, it's, it's getting to the motivations of this deity concept. Like, um, and I think, Cam, you are the one who even um, told me about this, that, okay, there actually could be a God of some sort, and there is a universe, but maybe this God didn't even create it. Like there's, you're assuming a motivation to create it. Right. So, and it's also important to recognize that probabilistically, the more attributes that you add to God in order for God to explain why the universe is exactly the way it is, you know, with, for example, as Luke was saying, this organic chemistry that, you know, creates this part of life that's different from the type of life that we have in heaven. Um, each time you do that by adding this additional motivation property desire that god has you're actually lowering the prior probability that that god exists and so by increasing how expected what evidence we see is on the god theory you're at the same time trading off the probability by making your explanation more ad hoc because you are adding these attributes to it for which you have no reason. So whenever we add like an additional detail to a theory, um, we have to have a motivation why it has that property as opposed to not. And the motivation can't be contained within the simple fact that we have some evidence that we want to explain. Because if you, if it, if you're only adding the property to the theory because you want to explain some particular evidence, you have to understand you're actually, you're, um, what, what's the phrase? Like you're borrowing from Peter to pay Paul. You, you're taking like, you're taking like some okay, so virtue wanna, out of one bucket and putting it into a different bucket. I want to make this very simple. So let's say, let's say the odds of a God existing or not is 50, 50. Uh, what you're saying is now if we add in the motivation of this God to want to have the desire to create a universe sustainable for life, whatever probability, let's say that's 50, 50. What you're saying is now we have to take 0.5 times 0.5. And now the probability of this God actually creating the universe is 25% instead of 50. And if we keep on adding different motivations, yeah, well, the prior probability, the prior probability of the God existing, it's even worse than that, because in order to assume that a God has a desire, you must assume that the God also has some kind of properties that allows it to have desires at all. So it's not just like assuming that it has a particular desire. It's also assuming that it has some kind of 
ability to have desires, um, which means that, you know, I guess the only analogy that we have to things that have desires are things that have minds like humans and animals and things like that that are minded. So you've obviously assumed that God has a mind and that God's mind has desires. And it goes all the way. Um, now, of course, it's true that traditional conceptions of God do have these properties, but I don't think that that rescues things. Yeah, that's good. I really like that, Cam. You know, floating completely oblivious to each other. We're not playing with monopoly money. We really can influence each other. Um, well, before and let's leave the the sort of the question of whether uh, a multiverse explanation, you know, on naturalism kind of mm. does also answer the question anyway. Um, to to last, if you like, and just just go ahead with these two elements that you've you've thrown up as a question. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, firstly, um, Luke's just throwing it back to you, I guess, there, Sean, and saying, look, there are clearly some elements um, of the fine tuning that that it's clear that we would not simply could not get a universe in which anything interesting would happen if you change the. Uh, you know the 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 values and so on um so it, it it is a phenomenon that you have to kind of own up to it, it, i guess is luke's point yeah again uh i i do not have any principled scientific argument that says that our universe is not finely tuned i'm just very very skeptical about attempts to quantify it and say what would happen if the parameters were different i agree that for example if the cosmological constant were at the planck scale for those of you listening at home, this is to say if the energy of empty space were enormously, enormously larger than we observe it to be today, then it's very hard to imagine uh, a universe that just has enough room for interesting things to happen. Uh, but this is sort of it, exactly the kind of case where it almost becomes a god of the gaps kind of issue because there are famous examples of fine tuning. Why is the cosmological constant small? Why is the average energy density of the universe exactly the critical density, which when we, 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 they appear to us to be very finely tuned. But what that means is we have a guess for what they might have been and what we observe them to be is something very, very specific. But you know what? Maybe the guess was just wrong. In the case of the density of the universe, we actually have quantitative explanations for why it is exactly the value it has. So what used to be a fine tuning just becomes the most natural thing in the world. The cosmological constant, the energy density of the vacuum, I suspect is going to be exactly the same thing. There are theories on the market, and uh, I'm in favor of some of them myself, that say, in fact, we just had the wrong guess. You know, if we understand quantum gravity well, the fact that there's this huge hierarchy between the cosmological constant and the quantum gravity scale is the most natural thing in the world. So I guess it's it's um, to say there's there's going to be probably underlying principles that we'll get to, uh, Luke, which will... I totally understand why Sean Carroll's not doing this. And maybe because uh, it gets to motivations and so forth. But I think my answer to theists is, a, at least on a psychological level, a better one <laughs> on the fine-tuning argument. And that is, they don't like to view their God as being constrained or restricted or bound. And by just postulating that fine-tuned argument, you're saying those dials are dialed in and that God couldn't have done it any other way. He had to dial it in just so, so we could be here. And that doesn't sit well with the theist, that this God had to, had to, compelled to dial those things in just so. Now, if they say, no, he could have dialed it in a different way and we could still be here, then the fine-tuned argument just goes out the window. Well, then it could be anything for life. Well, and that's the difficulty I was pointing out before, is that it seems clear on most Christian accounts that there, uh, life can exist without this physical universe. So we do need to posit a motivation God had to create a universe like this, other than just having us live like we will in heaven. So on the Christian's conception of things, there must be some additional motivation for it to be a physical world. And you have to account for that and not just hand wave. Like if you're demanding that the naturalist theory need to account for why the equation is the way that it is, um, uh, over and above just the fact that we discover it, um, then you also must account for why it is that God chose this particular version. 
And you, when you're conceding that life can exist in other ways, if God is true, like you were pointing out before, then, you know, you're, you're kind of already meeting some problems in your argument. Yeah, I just had a th interesting thought, like, I'm going to ask a Christian next time, like, do they think heaven is finely tuned as well? Is hell finely tuned? Is it physical? You know, interesting questions. I'm perfectly naturally explain the, the reason that these numbers take the particular value they do in that sense. I mean, does that, in a sense, solve, you know, t dismiss fine tuning or is it just kicking it up another level or whatever it might be? So the worry I have is this. So we we don't well we have yeah as Sean said there's ideas on the market but there's you know there's a lot of them so the the way I presented it was let, let's try and do the best we can with what we've got so if one of those theories comes along and says all right here is that my deeper explanation for what's going on then we'll ask the fine tuning question of that theory as well we will ask it for so Sean was referring to um, cosmic inflation as as um, oh, uh, possibly your other work on on the density of the universe, the flatness problem as well. Um, when those ideas come along, we'll have a look at them. The uh, the point of the, my argument was just saying, let's do the best we can with the, the, the ideas that we've got. But even beyond then, think about you know the, the ultimate laws of na nature up on that blackboard again, all right? Alberta's blackboard that we've we've had the universe solved for us. There's there's not going to be anything that tells us why on naturalism, why those particular laws rather than some other laws. So we, we'd still ask the fine tuning question, even if we totally solved everything in physics. If there might be the case that when we get to that final blackboard, there'll be no free numbers on that blackboard. This was Einstein's dream. That would be amazing, right? That'd be fantastic. Maybe. But what we'd still ask then, okay, what about the other ways that the you know the ultimate principles of the universe could have been. We can ask all the same sorts of questions. Fine tuning tries to get a handle on the best um, the best handle we can get on if we're trying to test naturalism. What other universes could there have been? Maybe we've got the wrong set. Sure, but the best we can do still suggests a problem. Then I, I think we've we've still got you know, naturalism still got a problem. Well, I think it's. Uh... The, the same kind of thing that we're talking about, you know, why is it that way? And I'm just really happy with saying that eventually we find out that's the way it is. I'm not going to rely or lean on the idea that someday we'll find that's the only way it could have been. I'm just really happy with, I'm comfortable with brute facts. I don't think that there's any way around them, so I hope that everyone becomes comfortable with them. Uh, we live in a simple universe, a simple universe that allows for the existence of life. Uh, is that a coincidence if we randomly chose universes, but we have gotten something very different? Or is that something very robust? What most, most universes you choose have regions in them that support life. That's where I, I need to be humble. I don't think we have any uh, right to say one way or the other. So it could be that, in fact, in the space of all possible universes, there's a sensible measure on that space and the subset of life uh, supporting universes is very, very small, and therefore there is a rigorous quantitative fine-tuning problem. And if that turns out to be the case in some future understanding of the possible laws of physics, then it will be good evidence for uh, theistic fine-tuning. But I just don't think that we're anywhere close to that. Quick, quick response, and then we must move on to multiverse before we close out today's program, Luke. Well, it seems like we could do all of that that you just said and, and that Sean just said, and still say, you know, there's this small number. And so we say the universe is, is life permitting and that's all there is to it. You know, there are brute facts. Why not fine tune brute facts? And that's the end of the story. So I think, I think what, what's quite clear and why I quite like Sean's book on this um, is, is that's kind of the price of naturalism. You, whatever turns up on Alberta's blackboard are the ultimate laws of physics. You just have to grin and smile and say those are the ultimate brute facts of, of reality. That's the price of naturalism. Whatever's on that whiteboard, you just got to grin and bear it and say, well, that's just the brute facts. But Theus, you say the exact same thing about the nature of your God. Whatever the blackboards or whiteboard says on uh, the nature of your deity, you just got to grin and bear it. What it is is what it is. But yeah, that, like I was pointing out, they don't like to see it that way. And I guess that's a psychological thing. I, d I don't know. But um, it seems a pretty uh, consistent or what, what, like analogous position. Yeah. 
We're almost done. And if they look fine tuned, or if there's a beginning of the cosmos, or if they're, you know, if they're ridiculously elegant or simpler than you might expect, or, you know, whatever the case may be, you just say that's the ultimate principles. We've explained reality, and you high five and go to the pub. <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to the pub after this. But um, we, we, why don't we just talk? Because I'd say we we could go on talking about this for for the rest of the remaining time. But I, I do want us to get to the issue of the multiverse because obviously you tackle this in the book and in mm. a sense this is a kind of where you and Geraint part ways in in your own book here uh Luke uh, because obviously Geraint um believes that a naturalistic explanation is at hand in the multiverse explanation and if I can very briefly surmise that as a layman it's the idea that um we are but one of many universes um that could have been produced say in an inflationary period um uh, of the universe and that if all of you know if they each come out with all kinds of different values and fundamental constants and so on uh, then we just happen to live in the one that one of the ones that is able to pr to produce a life and so on and so we we won the lottery effectively um is is the kind of view of that um that's a very very um, <laughs> small sketch of, of what we're talking about here um I, so for you um Sean this, if you like, is the other card that you can play to Luke to say, um, yes, I'm very happy that we do have a, a naturalistic explanation here. Um, I, I mean, how how um, convinced are you personally, Sean, of a multiverse, given that it's obviously something, as far as I'm aware, we can't physically access, we can't sort of um, directly uh, uh, scientifically investigate in that sense? Yeah, I would say I'm not at all confident about the multiverse in any sense whatsoever. I mean, to be very honest, I think that maybe we live in a multiverse, maybe we don't. 50-50 chance. I'm not going to bet any money on it either way. I can see, given our current quite crude understanding of quantum gravity and early universe cosmology, plausible scenarios either way. Um, and I think that if we really, really do convince ourselves that there, it requires a substantial amount of fine-tuning of the physical parameters to allow for complex life, for me as a naturalist, that would qualify as good evidence in favor of living in a multiverse. Okay. Um, but for you, um, even though you're, you're not particularly confident in the concept of a multiverse, it's still a better explanation on the table than a God explanation. Yeah, absolutely. Because once again, I balance in my mind what would the universe look like in one scenario versus what it would look like in another one. I mean, we haven't even talked about all the reasons why I think that the theistic predictions are wildly different than the, than the universe that we see, not just in cosmological terms, but down here in human life terms. So to me, the evidence against the existence of anything like the classical theistic God is overwhelmingly strong. And therefore, the fact that there's a perfectly good explanation for biophilic fine tuning right there on the floor in the terms of the multiverse is perfectly comfortable to me. Okay. So, uh, Sean basically just said, we haven't even gotten into why, what I would expect if, if uh, the universe was made by a God. And I've actually heard Sean Carroll, and I think you too, ha Cam have heard him explain and sort of list out what he would expect if there was a God, how the universe would look. I'm just going from the top of my head, like you would expect less wasted space. <laughs> That's an obvious one. You would expect that um, that maybe not 96% of our universe is the things we don't view as matter, like uh, electrons, protons, neutrons, uh, elements, and so forth. Uh, only 4% of our universe has elements in it. And then of that percentage, it's far, far, far smaller that we have anything resembling any sort of life, maybe amino acid on another planet, who knows. Um, but, you know, just, and then if you look at the Earth, the Earth is not fine-tuned for us. It's like only, it's 60% water. We can't live underwater. Uh, it, or seventy percent water. Uh, yeah, all that stuff. The, another two, another two ones is uh, I don't understand why we would expect um, human life to have come about through an incredibly um, amoral process of evolution by natural selection. Yes, yeah, so. I I don't see I don't see why the universe would be expected to be as old as it is with a cosmological age just dwarfing the type of 
t length of time we experience as humans. And I mean, there's a variety of specific physical things as well. Like, why is it that the entropy of the early universe was incredibly low? It doesn't seem to be necessitated by God. Yeah, it's, uh, but the evolution one you just said that um, if you would expect a God, why is there evolution? Uh, I think a lot of Christians would agree with you, yeah, and then, but I reject evolution. And so at least a third of Americans would say that. Luke, obviously, there, there's a wider data, I guess, data set to the, 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 that Sean is using here is because he, he's, there are other reasons for him thinking that, that God is not a ex good explanation anyway. And so, yeah, as it stands, um, on the basis of that fact, even though he's not completely confident in a, in a multiverse, it's still a better explanation. It's still a more likely scenario as to why we live in, a, in an apparently finely tuned universe. So, so where, where do you go on this one? So don't, don't get me wrong, I am a cosmologist, so a multiverse, you know, that's just more universe for me, right? So that's, <laughs> I, I don't have any problem with that. Uh, specifically, you know, as a, a theist, I, it, there could still be a multiverse. That might be the most natural way, simple way to make a universe in which some part of it is life permitting. So I don't particularly have a problem here. W thinking in fine-tuning terms, though, here's, here's the problem. So let, let me just do a test case here. Suppose the, the fundamental parameter of our universe we were thinking about, fundamentally in inverted commas, was the distance from the Earth to the sun. Let's go back to, you know, uh, uh, Ptolemy or whatever. And, and someone works out, oh, hang on, if, you know, if the Earth were this much closer to the sun, we'd all boil, and if we were further away, we'd all freeze. So that looks fine-tuned. And then someone says, oh, no, hang on a sec, there's heaps of other planets out there uh, the universe will just make a whole heap of planets. They'll be at all sorts of distances from their their suns. And so that will explain why there's some planet somewhere which gets it right for life, okay? What I now want to do is to say, okay, we're trying to think of in naturalism, a set of naturalistic universes. We now got to ask the question, what does it take for a universe in terms of deeper, more actually fundamental quantities, like how much is, how heavy is an electron, uh, what does it take for a universe to make lots of planets? That's that's the question I want to ask about this theory. And we find, if fine tuning is correct, which I argue it is, that actually that that requires a lot from fundamental physics. And so now that we, we we do it again, we say now there's lots of places in the universe where there's different values of these numbers. And what I want to do is to say, okay, great, show me a theory. What are its fundamental assumptions, and will it do all of that in a natural way or will it do that in a fine-tuned way and and because we don't have any sort of anything like a final theory of the universe we can't do that calculation and so really the problem is i, I think we have a good handle in fine-tuning of a way to actually get at you know what would i expect on naturalism and the response is to try and punt that sort of into the darkness so where i can't do the calculate the calculation the idea that i actually want to do so that's that's one of my problems with this. Even if there is a multiverse, it's not it it, it doesn't necessarily explain fine tuning. Sean? Yeah, I think um, I got lost somewhere in there. I hate I hate to say because Lucas is, is extraordinarily clear. This is probably my fault. But um, the the general idea of the multiverse, which by the way, you know, again, we don't know if it's true. And even the phrase the multiverse, like all of these different ideas we're talking about has many, many different versions of it, right? Mm -hmm. So you could have a multiverse where nowhere in the multiverse was it possible to have life or a multiverse where everywhere is just like our uh, universe out there. But the idea that gets people excited is, comes from what is called the landscape of string theory, where in string theory, also in other theories, but string theory is the, is the most popular one, uh, what you find is that space-time itself is kind of like water in the sense that it appears in different phases. Water has a liquid phase, a solid phase, a gas phase, and so forth. So space, with all of its particles and forces in it, also has all of these different phases. And when you go through the math, we have no idea how many phases there are, but it's jai humongous numbers, right? Something like 10 to the 500 is the famous number to bat about. And if that's true, then we also have separately this theory of eternal inflation, this idea that the universe can undergo a super rapid expansion at early times and then quantum fluctuations can kick you from one phase of space-time to another one. So not only is it possible to have 
local regions of space where the laws of physics are very different. But it's natural. It's a prediction. You know, the multiverse on the on the side of physicists and cosmologists was not something that came about either because we were just saying, you know, well, wouldn't it be cool? There were all these universes or something that came about because people said, well, we have fine tuning. How do we explain that? It came about, you know, we were dragged into it, kicking and screaming, because we had other reasons to like these theories called inflation and string theory, and together they predict a multiverse, like it or not. And within that uh, understanding, we should get so many different kinds of conditions uh, of, of what's going on in space-time that it is essentially inevitable that uh, some of them will be perfectly hospitable to the existence of life. I mean, let's have one response from you, Luke, to to that, but which is essentially, you know, Sean laying out again the the, the way in which the multiverse is a conceivable possibility. And um, I mean, from your perspective, though, I think what you've been saying is, um, even if I grant you such a multiverse, um, it doesn't get you off the hook in terms of having to justify the fine tuning of of kind of a multi, you know, a multiverse itself and and those kinds of things. But unfortunately, because it's out of reach, scientifically speaking, if you like, you're kind of positing something that that kind of gets you off the hook of having to answer that that particular question. Is is that? Yeah, let, let you know see. what that's called cool. amongst cosmologists, and Sean's more in. I can't hear you. Were you bringing up sh uh, special pleading again? Yeah, well, it's like a God of the Gaps or... Yeah, uh, what, what's the moderator's name again? Justin, Justin Briley. Justin, yeah, what Justin just said, uh, like I would ask him the exact same thing back to the theist perspective. Um, but anyhow, let's, we're almost done here. We got, uh, I think, five minutes left. Well, than I am about whether, in fact, eternal inflation is inevitable as inevitable as as Sean just claimed it was, and that's that's you know the sort of calculation I would like to do, which we can do for fine tuning, which I would like to do for inflation. It, it, you know, it's a bit up in the air as to whether that's that's sure or not. But that's that's uh, too much more would go too far afield. <laughs> I, I want to get back to Sean's questions. Mm. What are the questions then that that you 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 specifically want? To it needs to be pointed out that in this phase of the conversation, Luke has freely admitted that in a multiverse scenario, he would have to give up his entire current argument and replace it with another form of fine tuning argument that depends solely on uh, the particular laws as opposed to particular constants. And it's kind of weird, like, so like this argument isn't good or like this argument does have like a, a def an easy defeater? Like I don't kind of get it. Well, and I typed this out in the chat when he said it. Uh, I forget the, his exact wording, but I think he said he has no problem with the multiverse idea. He's He said something like, I'm a cosmologist. I, I accept that the multiverse could be true. Um, so yeah, that sent like a. But like, as soon as you say that, like, you must realize it undercuts his his fine tuning argument as presented. Well, at least he he would just say that um, all the universes are fine tuned, <laughs> but it's it's kind of like yeah, I know. But then he has to make a different argument, though. Right. That's the problem. Right. But if all the universes are fine tuned for life, then none of them are in a sense like it's the famous uh, Incredibles movie line. If everybody's incredible, then no one is. <coughs> but all right, let's continue to respond as we close things out here. Oh, well, Sean's uh, challenges for, for naturalism. Uh, sorry, sorry, for theism. And particularly, is this the kind of universe that we would expect on theism? Uh, a very good, well laid out in the book, uh, by the way, uh, his book. Um, one of the there's a there's an interesting little assumption in there, and and so Sean Sean said that if we thought that we were important to God, we should play a crucial role in this universe, and that I I don't see the connection between those two. Right, my kids do nothing for the structural integrity of my house, right? Nothing whatsoever. Uh, I I don't see why if we were important to God we would have the the we would expect a a human sized universe because we don't measure importance with physical size, 
And in particular, um, I think one of the effects that that the universe has had on the history of humanity is that as we've looked at the infinitely huge universe, we've realized our smallness, and that has been for thousands of years the best handle that human beings can get on the sort of infinity of God. And so I'm not saying it's a prediction, mm. I'm not saying it's something ahead of time I could have discovered in the cave, but certainly the the worry I have about that um consideration would i expect a universe this big on theism the sort of handle that that gives me on this question is pales in comparison to the the problem i think fine tuning raises for naturalism but so that goes back to what i was saying earlier of how i don't really think he's engaging with the problem of how it reduces the prior probability of his theory He's just like allowing himself to just hand wave and say, um, you know, there, there is no need for there to be a connection between uh, why the user universe has its size and why the universe, or why God or God's motivation. Or God's reasoning, like maybe this God is not an efficient God, he cares less about efficiency. Like, who cares if you need, uh, what, what, what's the size of our un observable universe? Is it 46 billion or trillion light years, something like that? Um, and why is it that uh, so little life is in it for that size? Well, God does, just doesn't care about efficiency. Like, he, doesn't care, he cares about quality, not quantity. <laughs> How do you know that? <laughs> comments here because uh, i've i've taken up already too much of your time gentlemen and uh, this is a, a sort of extended really edition of the podcast um uh, if, uh, exclusively for podcast listeners really we won't be able to fit as much all of this conversation into the radio edition of the program but but um where, where do you want to start to draw things together sean it's been a really interesting conversation where where, where do you want to land up yeah i mean i think I, I feel the need to say one more thing just at that last point which maybe works as a as a beginning of a summing up okay which is that go ahead Ironically enough, I feel that theists don't give God nearly as much credit <laughs> as he deserves. I think that if God existed, you know, God could do whatever God wants. That's kind of God's thing, right? And <clears throat> the remarkable feature of the world that we observe is that it looks really, really, really close to as if God isn't doing anything right? Things are obeying the laws of physics. Things are obeying their, their, their natural things. There's not a lot of obvious interventions. Um, God could have just created the solar system or the galaxy rather than this giant universe. And the usual move is to say, well, God likes to see nature obeying the laws of physics, right? Uh, God likes to work in ways that are the least interventionist when it comes to physics and cosmology. And that's completely plausible. I mean, I, that's possible. I don't see any derivation of that idea from the notion of God all by itself. To me, it sounds like special pleading. To me, it sounds exactly like the situation where you say, I, I know what the universe looks like already. Let me think about what God would have done. Oh, yes, exactly this kind of thing. The alternative is to say that, you know, God is not actually playing an important role in the whole shebang. Is it special pleading? Luke, as far as you're concerned? Oh, your readers are going to, your <laughs> listeners, sorry, are going to have to work that out for themselves. I certainly understand that point of view. Um, I, I think all I'd say is that, you know, you, you have to take both sides of this very seriously. One of the things that I think... Is this special pleading, Luke? Uh, your listeners have to figure that out on their... No, he's asking you, is this special <laughs> pleading? <laughs> That was, a, yeah. Luke has been a pretty good guy uh, for most of this interview, answering the questions, but that was clearly a dodge. Um, that was a dodge, yeah. It is a very important thing for, for theists to think through is the famous problem of evil. So we look at the things in our universe which don't seem to fit and, and you know, like, you know, pain and suffering and all those sorts of things. And those are, it, are things that people say, you know, why would a good God do that sort of thing? No one's ever attempted a an argument uh, from from love or an argument from beauty or against God. Mm. These are things that that intuitively make sense to me. If there's a God, 
you a universe would be beautiful. Yeah, that, yeah, that sort of yeah. makes sense. Again, not a prediction. It's something we understand. So I think the fact that, that people see how that bit fits at least, that no one's tried to produce the sort of atheistic argument from beauty is possibly a way of putting that, but people are going to have to decide this one for themselves. <laughs> I think. Yes, there's an atheistic argument from beauty. I don't know what he's talking about there. We're going to have to start to leave it there, I'm afraid, gentlemen. It's been really, really fascinating um, getting you both on the program today. We could have gone on for another hour, at least, um, talking about some of these issues. But I really appreciate the way you both handled yourself and um, the, um, the, the the tremendous food for thought we've had in the course of today's program. Uh, if you want to get in touch, I'll be giving out the ways to, to do that in just a moment's time. But for the moment, um, do, do get hold of um, both Sean and Luke's books, and you'll be able to... Um, look into these things at a deeper level as well for yourself. Again, preposterousuniverse.com for Sean. And uh, Luke is at lukebarnes.info and more about his book, A Fortunate Universe, there. Um, Sean, thank you very much for being on the program with me today. Sure, my pleasure. It was a lot of fun. It was great fun to have you on. Luke, thank you for popping in as part of your uh, tour while you're over here in the UK. Thanks very much. And Sean's point about overtuning is on 300, page 311 <laughs> of his book, if you want to get sorry about that. <laughs> Great. You can buy my book right now, and you can buy Luke's book, I'm sure, on Amazon or from your iPhone right now. <laughs> Great stuff. Thank you both, gentlemen, and um, and all the very best. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, any f my final thoughts on it, I, I thought the two guys were definitely very cordial, polite to each other, for the most part answered all the questions that um, the moderator asked. I'm disappointed that they didn't get into the area of ex what Sean Carroll would think a um, theistic universe would look like. They really didn't even, well, they kind of just touched upon it. But uh, for those of you who, who are uh, theist and listening and don't know what, what Sean argument would expect the universe to look like if there was a God, uh, he outlines it nicely in one of his videos. You could just type in those keywords in YouTube. Do you have any final thoughts, Cam? Yeah, I thought it was a pleasant interaction. Uh, I have quite a bit of respect for Luke Barnes. Like, I think that he's attempting to do something um, that's methodologically sound. And I, I think he's trying to play the game by the right rules. Uh, I think he's failing at that. But um, but I do, I do respect that he isn't... Um, yeah, and I respect that as a physicist, he's actually attempting to ask some of those questions of like, what would we expect on each worldview or on each idea? Um, because without doing that, I think we can't make comparisons. And uh, yeah, I like that aspect of them. And I think the most brilliant thing that you mentioned today was that whole prior probability issue, because it could be entirely possible that a God does exist, but yet he didn't create this universe that we find ourselves in. And I don't think that even thought enters the mind of most theists, that they have to actually link the two, that not only do we have this universe that we find ourselves in, and not only do they believe that there's a God, but now you have to figure out why do you think this God wanted to create a universe, had the ability to create the universe? All these things that you brought up, Cam, that each, if you look on it purely mathematically, there's a probability for the first one, a probability for the second one, and when you start multiplying those probabilities together, it becomes less likely that this God actually wanted and did it and could do it and all these things. And But, but then what the theist would go down is, well, right now this whole conversation is basically deism a creator type God. But in order to answer all those questions I just asked, they have to get into the specifics of a specific type of theism, which opens up a whole new set of questions. Well, how do you know this is reliable and that's reliable and so forth? Yeah, and I do think that there's a, a significant lack of uh, definiteness to the theistic theory. I think it's not very well defined. And I think that it very conveniently has things added and subtracted from it to account for evidence. And that's a bad sign. Whereas the natural, the naturalistic, like the physical equations style explanation, you know, that, that doesn't have that property at all. It's definite. 
yeah. while still undiscovered, but progress is being made. For anyone, Stay tuned. For anyone who believes in a, for anyone who believes in a monotheistic type god, like ask them to write down in a paragraph what they think this god is like, and then let's compare notes around the world. I'd love to, <laughs> love to see that. Uh, even even within one denomination, you'll have variations. So. Okay. Alrighty, I gotta hit off now. Okay, don't go yet. Uh, we had lots of people watching. Thank you. People probably came in and out because this this is probably a two and a half hour. That's my guess that we were on, but it was very interesting. And if so, if you do want to rewatch uh, Sean Carroll and Luke Barnes, uh, you can either do it here or on the Christian Radio website. Hopefully, they don't get mad at us that we basically played the whole thing. But I hope we did add some value to it by interacting uh, here and there with it. So don't demonetize us, YouTube. <laughs> Please. <laughs> okay, see you guys. Take yeah. care.